On today's episode, we're talking to Tom Cook from Spacely about the future of space hiring. Plus, Emily and I will talk about what's caught our eye in the world of space flight. What do you think could be interesting in the world of space hiring? Please tell us via our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. Please consider joining us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Space and Things. But right now, enjoy episode 134 of the Space and Things Podcast. Time to shake off a case of the Thursdays and listen to Space and Things with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to episode 134 of the Space and Things podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Busy week so far, but uh, so far doing pretty good. So something interesting happened this week, but I'll talk more about it on um, during our news segment. We'll just put it that way. Interesting. I'm not sure whether to be scared. Anyway. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> on- <laughs> You're good. It's not that bad. It's not bad. <laughs> on to this week's main feature. Today, we're speaking to Tom Cook, who is co-founder and CEO of Spacely a digital marketplace connecting independent workers to the aerospace industry. We know plenty of our listeners either already work in aerospace or aspire to. So when we heard about Spacely, we figured it might be a good thing to discuss. Tom is a U.S. Air Force Academy graduate who spent 16 of his 24 years of service in space systems development and operations after retiring from the Air Force in 2017 He began researching open talent marketplace utilization across industries and potential applications for the aerospace industry. This led to the formation of Spacely in January 2020. In June 2020, Spacely was selected to be part of a five-year contract effort to bring forward aerospace-specific expertise to support NASA's open innovation efforts through an open talent marketplace model. Spacely's goals are to be a trusted network partner in providing access to talent for the aerospace industry and to bring forward opportunities to those who want to contribute and take part in the growing space economy. So let's speak to Tom all about Spacely. Just a vehicle for space memes. It's Space and Things. Hi, Tom, and thank you very much for joining us today. First, let's start at the beginning. What prompted your interest in aerospace? Did you have a formative experience during your childhood or during your education? And was there a specific event that may have caught your eye? Oh, boy, that's a that's a great start, Emily. Yeah. So um, (laughs) when I was looking at what my life was going to be like after high school, I didn't have a ton of options, to be honest. I grew up in in a rural part of Virginia and had not applied myself in school and I was thinking about going into the military and I was 17 when I graduated. So my mom said, Hey, if the military is an option for you and you want to go that route to get money for school, you cannot go in the Marine Corps like you'd like to. We will sign for you though, to go in the air force. And so actually that's how I ended up in the air force. And really once I got in uh, to the air force, I had all these formative experiences while I was in that then got me excited about a career. And that's, I think, those early experiences working with uh, satellite technology, early satellite technology, communications, uh, computer systems early on in the, in the 90s uh, were all formative in a way that I wasn't the traditional person who had been dreaming about it since childhood. But as I got into the Air Force, uh, we're so formative that I just got excited and wanted to stay around as long as I could. That makes a lot of sense. So you are the co-founder and CEO of Spacely a digital marketplace connecting independent workers to the aerospace industry. Now, what initially prompted you to investigate using such a platform and relating it to the aerospace world, which quite frankly has used rather outdated hiring modes in the past? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. well, I think that's part of it. You know, part of my experience being on the government side, I was a program manager for satellite systems, We had incredible partners, you know, with uh, traditional companies, but there were times where we would have a problem and we just didn't have the right expertise at the right time for the, for the problem uh, that came up. 
And so this always stuck with me throughout my career as I was kind of finishing and winding down 24 years in the Air Force. I would see kind of like these inefficiencies in the hiring practices, um, certainly the clearance practices. We tried to create security clearances and you know classification of all this work. And I got really excited when there was so much private investment coming into the space industry over the last three years that, well, hey, a lot of things that we classified just 10 years ago are no longer going to require classification. That's going to open up a broader population of people that can potentially work on these technologies, these ideas, these concepts. But if we continue to use our kind of archaic hiring practices that take a year to two years to bring people into the industry, we're losing out, in our opinion, on kind of new concepts and, and capabilities to access talent in different ways and, and not necessarily require them to uh, jump ship from one company just so they can participate in the industry. So if you have talent that sits in other industries, but is relevant to aerospace, why not create a pathway for that talent? And so I didn't see anything uh, uh, along those lines. And, and actually, I read a book in 2017 called Reimagining Work by Rob Biederman. And Rob had went to Harvard Business School and he, he laughs about you know this concept you know ranking dead last in his cohort at HBS. Uh, but he had an investor come up to him afterwards and uh, helped him form Catalan Technologies, which was a marketplace for management consulting. So if you're working for Bain or McKinsey or any of the big consulting firms and you're you know doing pretty well uh, financially as a young person, but you're working 60 to 80 hour work weeks and um, you're getting about 40 to 60 percent of what the company is charging, he looked at it and he said, well, how could I potentially go and see what the open market provides me? Um, you know, from that expertise and, and uh, talent that I've built over the years. And um, and so obviously that takes a little bit of courage and strength to go out on the open market and, and see what you're worth. Uh, maybe not as much of a safety net as what you might think you have in a, in a traditional job. But he talked about that and he talked about the future of work in his mind where, you know, what if we don't rely on one employer in the future and, you know, whether they can continue to employ us or lay us off as we've been seeing in the tech industry. And what if we actually stack work uh, with multiple employers, so we're more resilient employers and employees, and um, in that way, if you know one company uh, no longer has a role for us, uh, we're not just stuck out in the cold um, now trying to find another job uh, just to do go through that again. And what if we stack work uh, in a much different way where we're all more resilient, the economy is more resilient, the workers are more resilient. So that all very much resonated with me. And I said, hey, I'd like to bring this concept to the industry. And I didn't really see anyone else doing that in the in a in a scaled way. So we're, we're really trying to do that uh, where we're, we're bringing more and more projects and tasks, deconstructing jobs into projects and tasks and, and bringing more of that out into the public uh, you know, sphere. So tell us some success stories since Spacely was instituted in 2020. Uh, has an open talent marketplace proved to increase accessibility to the industry, do you think? Uh, not as not as much as we'd hoped, obviously, by this point. I will say specifically to our contract with NASA, yes. Uh, and that's invariably yes. Uh, the team we're working with right now is called the Convergent Aeronautic Solution. Convergent means they're using ideas from everywhere to come up with what the future of aerospace looks like in the next 30 to 50 years. They're not just asking aerospace engineers that question. And so what I've been really enjoyed about working with that team is they are looking broadly, which means, hey, we're not trying to hire everyone to NASA. We can't do that anyway. And it's also hard to get someone that's working for a half million dollars to come in and say, oh, I love space um, and I love it so much, I'm willing to take $120,000 salary. <laughs> and so their model of accessing talent and using multiple marketplaces, talent marketplaces, to bring that expertise forward has been very successful and has continued to inform uh, the progress of how do you design for the future while accounting for today, right? And what today's structures and systems and processes are. And so it's been very successful in putting process around and rigor around future scaping, future scenario building, and not just doing it as kind of this, this thought exercise, really trying to really design for the future, uh, given what constraints you have today. So yeah, I would say NASA has really demonstrated a lot of value in this area, and we're trying to highlight the benefit that they've received from this 
and, and have the larger aerospace industry kind of pilot some projects around these ideas. And we're also kind of warning the industry, hey, you know, a lot of you are dependent on contracts with NASA or the DOD, Space Force and Air Force. NASA is looking at asking you in future RFPs, what are you doing for open innovation? What are you doing with talent marketplaces? How are you identifying accessing talent and what's your structure and strategy there? And what we're letting the folks know in the, in the larger aerospace industry is you, you probably should be able to answer that question if you want to continue working with NASA in the future, because they recognize it's going to be a more disaggregated, decentralized uh, environment. And you have to have a plan uh, to, to work in that way if you're going to work with NASA in the, in the future years. Okay. So concerning accessibility, it's not just a buzzword anymore. Mm -hmm. Fostering diversity is huge in the space flight world right yeah. now, which classically has obviously been dominated by white men. How do you think an open talent marketplace can promote the inclusivity needed in the aerospace industry? Yeah, this is, you know, I've been on this one for a little while as well. You know, being in LA, um, in the El Segundo area for uh, Space and Missile System Center and El Space uh, System Command, uh, almost 90% of DOD space dollars flows through that organization in LA, which, by the way, is 90% white male. So, you know, when we look at the demographics of where folks are benefiting currently and in the past, uh, you know, have you have LA, Houston, Washington, D.C., and Melbourne, Florida, and it's been very uh, geographically focused. And when you have a place like L.A. that's benefiting, you know, El Segundo specifically, it's benefiting so largely from all these government contracts flowing through and those funds flowing through that area, you're limited in the demographic of that area. And so if you want to create more diversity, you not only have to look at what you have already in, in, in a diverse population set, you also have to account for, can I recruit more diverse folks to that area? Mm. And frankly, if you have a, 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 a highly concentrated population set, it may be hard to diversify that because it may not be attractive to other, you know, groups to say, yeah, that's, you know, that's where I want to be, right? No, maybe I want to be where I grew up. Maybe I want to be uh, in, a, in a group or a, or a diverse set of groups and not just be in a homogeneous group. And so if we're limiting ourselves to where you can actually participate in the, in the economy meaningfully, uh, we're limited into what those uh, geographic groups look like. And so for us, we believe that with the you know acceleration of remote work, flexible mm -hmm. work, and opportunities through uh, digital technologies, you don't need to be geographically limited or focused any longer. And you're allowing you know different uh, groups of folks to participate meaningfully where they and meet them where they are. Um, and so you know, I think there's an opportunity here to bring more people, broader prop population sets into the industry than ever before, if we're willing to say that we don't need you to be in a windowless basement building five days a week uh, in you know El Segundo, right? So uh, by opening this up and trusting platforms uh, to be like ours to be able to do that, it, it, I think is key to increasing the diversity in the uh, workforce. You know, we talk a lot about trust, Airbnb, Turo, Great examples. You know, when Airbnb first came out, why did you start to trust that you weren't going to get murdered in your sleep if you slept on someone else's couch, some stranger's couch? So we are inherently trusting technology. There's pros and cons to that. But are there ways we can design for the future of work that accounts for digital technologies, build those trusting relationships just like we do with humans? And, and trust the technology and the vetting that goes into it so we can build meaningful, trusting relationships more broadly and not just in certain geographies. That's a good answer. That was such a good answer. Um, so in June 2020, uh, Spacely was selected by NASA as part of its open innovation efforts. Do you think that the Spacely model can innovate hiring at NASA? And how has it been to work with the world's most famous, prominent space agency? Yeah, we, we tell NASA all the time, we're just so thrilled to be working, not just because NASA um, in the history, right? The rich history, world-class organization, but brand, like the brand is incredible, yeah. right? If you go to any shopping mall or park, there's someone wearing a NASA shirt, right? And it's every demographic you can imagine. If you're a, you know, a, a private company, public company, who wouldn't want that brand? And what other government organization 
do you see people wearing that many shirts? No one's wearing IRS shirts. No one's wearing you know, all these other shirts from a government organization. So, you know, the, the model um, that they are exposing is saying, look, we, we are a big tent. We are uh, interested in citizen scientists. We are interested in your ideas. We are interested in uh, creating an infrastructure that allows you to participate even if you don't wear a NASA badge, we want to take the excitement of you and, and whatever is capturing your imagination by wanting to wear that NASA shirt, no matter who you are, to be able to be involved in some way. But I think more pragmatically, I think NASA, being a public entity, does struggle, frankly, with retention of talent, right? So if I have this much talent that I can be in an organization like NASA, well, I can probably be successful no matter where I go. And so is it enough to say, hey, I'm going to keep paying you $120,000 as a GS-11 or GS-12 because you're working towards the greater good? We heard that all the time in the military, right? Oh, hey, I think you guys could do better in the private sector, but it's not about money. It's about what public good you're providing with your energy. And there is a the natural tension there between how much is enough money for somebody? And that's a different question for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to have a different answer to that versus what benefit they believe they're providing their energy. And so I believe that NASA has done a fantastic job of showing that through this model, you can safely, securely, compliantly open up your organization, whether it be government or private, to folks that aren't necessarily badge wearers. And it can actually benefit your organization in the long term because you don't have just the same folks and the same ideas continually, right? And it shows that also when you leave, Whatever investment NASA's made or Lockheed or anyone else has made in that person, you know, if you have that pathway to retain access to that person and you show them that, you know, if that person decided to, you know, go into a different industry, uh, I have a friend went from F1 to Tesla, right? Same industry, but very different, you know, um, kind of environment they were working in. Okay, well, now, similarly, how do we keep access to that investment that we've made, no matter how long the person's been there? And if it's a binary choice of employed or not employed, well, we've lost access to the investment. So if we can keep some pathways open through this different model and not just have traditional hiring and acquisition of talent, but rather talent access, we believe that we can not only support NASA, but the industry at large be more robust, more resilient, more agile, more flexible and more accommodating to people rather than just aerospace engineers. That leads me nicely onto this. So what would you say to anyone who wants to get into the aerospace industry? Are there jobs for people of all skill sets available? Or are there just particular things that you think people should be focused on if they're going through their education, for example? What, what kind of things should people be thinking about adding to their CVs? Or for me, I'm a, I'm a musician, media background. Are there jobs for me within the aerospace industry? That's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Yeah, no, and I think more and more people are saying yes, that we see uh, jobs for everyone. It's If we're going to have a space economy, it's going to be everyone. It's not just going to be astronauts and scientists. It can't be, or else we'll never get to a you know, self-sustaining economy. You know, I love Chris Hadfield, an astronaut. You're thinking about your, your musical background, right? Love space oddity up on the ISS, mm -hmm. right? That to me was so capturing when I saw that the first time. And I just thought, man, how cool is this that he's bringing music together on the ISS? And it just, you know, and then it went with James Vaughn's illustrations and, and seeing, I, I used it, um, used one one time uh, in, a, in a briefing, you know, credited James because it was a little girl holding a teddy bear, you know, on a space station, looking at the big blue, you know, earth in front of them. And I just thought, wow, these storytellers are super important, right? They, it's just like science fiction. We talk about this with NASA all the time. Science fiction has a basis in science where fantasy writing does not, right? Um, science fiction gets us to believe that that's possible, right? Because it has a basis in science. So even though we may not have something right now in front of us, we can believe it might be possible because there's a basis to it. And so writers, illustrators, storytellers, musicians, every single person has to be involved if we're going to envision what it's like for us to not just live here, right? And we live on a space station, or we go to a space hotel, or we live on Mars, or we go to a lunar outpost, uh, or we have interstellar venture. And, you know, Hollywood's done so good over the years of trying to bring us different storylines that we can believe in, right? And then we see you know, something from 25 years ago now happened. And so truthfully, I believe that we have to find ways to get everyone in. 
Now, again, pragmatically right now, I would say the best way to get in and and, and also be resilient is look at the skill sets that are in high demand, artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud security, program management. Those happen to be the four most highest emerging skills that are needed across all industries, across all jobs. In the old days, if you wanted to work in aerospace, you're an aerospace engineer, mechanical engineer, scientist of some sort. Now, with the flattening of skill sets, everyone, all industries need AI, ML. Everyone needs cloud security and architecture. Everyone is being disrupted by technological advances. So I say for folks, as opposed to looking for maybe a niche way to get into the industry, look at that way of where the emerging skill sets are. See where your, your adjacent skill sets sit. What is your path to get to those emerging skills that are needed? And then that way, if you can't get in initially, you have an ability to get in somewhere, some industry, and then those experiences are just going to be as relevant as necessary and are going to be just as needed. So if we can get you a pathway into the aerospace industry, you're bringing a more rich, robust background and experience with you as opposed to very niche. And so we're going to still need very niche expertise, no question. We still have a need for guidance, navigation, control engineers, for example, But these other folks that bring in these other rich experiences are also going to have to bring their stories to help us inform what future state scenarios look like, both dystopian and utopian. Mm. And we've been that's what we've been working with NASA on over the last two and a half years are these scenario builds. And we need the storytellers and we need a lot of input from a lot of different people, from a lot of different backgrounds, because if not, we just get something that's not inclusive and is not helpful and is only there to benefit a select few. And that's not what we want to build for. So we have a broad international listenership. Mm-hmm. So is Spacely available to those outside the United States at the moment? Or is that something coming up? No, it is. Now, you know, some of the work is is definitely U.S. citizens only. And NASA highlights to us, you know, what in our engagements with them, which ones are U.S. only and which ones, you know, we can um, engage with our international uh, partners. Uh, we've purposefully left Spacely open, right? So some people say, well, that's stupid. You know, you might do that. Uh, <laughs> that's not really a good revenue model, um, but it's free to join. And, and we are going to be generating quite a bit more content this year. Uh, the last two years, a lot of this has been private consultation and we haven't been able to share in the work, uh, the NASA work specifically. Just today, uh, another podcast is, is launching. Um, and so uh, there's an announcement of that from NASA uh, called Ecosystemic Futures, uh, ran by uh, my colleague, Diane Finkhausen from Shoshin Works. We're going to be bringing out all of the uh, conversations we've been having with global thought leaders, and again, international global thought leaders uh, that have been coming into NASA and um, and really uh, discussing these, again, because NASA is a global brand. It's not a U.S. brand. And, and so um, NASA's, you know, the Artemis Accords, yeah. right? Uh, you have so much international participation. You have five eyes in the de- Department of Defense. So, you know, this is not going to be a U.S. only event. It may not even be U.S. led. So for us, it could be very interesting to have conversations coming in from the globe on what is a value, what is not a value. And that, again, that's going to be different for everyone. And the only way, in our opinion, we can capture that many individual opinions, facts, data sets is to start bringing in AI and ML, start bringing in a platform enabled ecosystem and allow the benefit, hopefully, of what we learn from Web 2.0 with Amazon, eBay, Facebook, Instagram. What are the, again, the utopian dystopian outcomes and then how do we build uh, for maybe uh, not bad, right? So it's not great, but it's not bad towards a more utopian vision. And again, that cannot be, it it can't be a a way that's um, not allowing all the voices to come in and and only just have U.S. voices. Now, we certainly have some restriction on some work that's U.S. only, but I truly believe with the commercial space companies and the private investment coming in there, that there's going to be a lot of discussion around ITAR, around other restrictions, as there always has been, because uh, these commercial space companies aren't going to just want to be dependent on DOD and NASA or U.S. um, customers. They're going to have a a true global business, just like Nike is, just like other companies, right? So there's going to be a lot of discussion around what this looks like as we truly create a global economy for space. And finally, where do you see Spacely in five years or 10 years? 
Ah, hopefully we're alive. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's been fun as a startup to see if this, you know, kind of resonates with anyone. I, you know, I truly believe whether or not Spacely is there or not, this future state scenario that we have high confidence in, whether it's utopian or dystopian, we do believe it's going to be more disaggregated and decentralized. So if you believe that right now SpaceX has a great opportunity in bringing together top talent, resources, and convening them all in one location, well, what's a disaggregated, decentralized future look like? Are you able to tap into an artificial and human global brain that takes the best of these ideas that are not now constrained uh, by one person, uh, one company, one company moniker? How do you build a Falcon 9 or a, you know, a Starship that's not underneath of a corporate entity? Is there a future where people are building things individually, and that's just one of many projects they're working on simultaneously, and they're not working for one company, and they're flexing you know, how much time they're working one week, 10 hours this week, 80 hours the next week, whatever individually works for them. I truly believe that we're going to be getting to more of an individualized work society. And, and, and I don't necessarily mean that that means everyone's not working as a team or working together or, or no one's working in the same location. What I mean is how structure, work is structured is going to be more individualized and it's going to be more integrated into life and not the other way around. And so our goal at Spacely is to make sure that we're helping people stay engaged on their own terms, because for us, if it's a, a choice of losing access to that talent or not tapping into that talent, or giving them just a, you know, a, an ability to be engaged in some small meaningful way or large meaningful way, we have to be able to account for greater individualization uh, of work. And so I think if it's not Spacely, uh, there's already over 800 other global talent marketplaces and things are marching in that direction. So I think that we'll see in the future, decentralized, disaggregated work doesn't necessarily mean that we aren't working together, we aren't teaming, we aren't seeing each other but we're just more purposeful in how we're structuring our own individual work days. Absolutely. Well, this all sounds wonderful. And thank you very much for coming on and, and talking to us about this and, and explaining the bigger picture. Cause uh, a lot of this, <laughs> I didn't really understand until you started speaking. And now I'm thinking about how I can be involved. I don't know if that's the same for you, Emily, but I'm thinking, Oh, uh, well, how do yeah. I can tap into this? Whoever needs any writers, I'm I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm open. So, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. You, I mean, look at your girl's background. You both understand gigs, right? Absolutely. Um, David, with your, your yeah, your music gigs. Emily, a freelance writer, and and people yeah. have multiple skills, right? So if I say, David, you're just going to do music all the time. You're not going to get to talk about space, right? Well, okay. Well, that's kind of bummer. I, I really enjoy yeah. space. So you know, it's more about how do we structure our days, and if we can then also be compensated and create a an environment where we can actually um, make a living and, and make a life worth living. That's of, of ultimate benefit. And then also it takes advantage of all the skills you bring in life. You don't feel like you're any more limited because, Hey, I'm kind of trapped in this one, you know, job, you know, 40, 68 hour work week. I can really uh, start to benefit from all the skills and all the capacity I have. And it's really about that optimization schema. So you two, I think are, are you know a friendly audience? There may be less friendly audiences, for them, but you know, I think we've we've thought through a lot of the pros and cons over the last two years, and we're happy to discuss and debate those. But we appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk with you all about what our efforts have been. Yeah, I guess the key thing is that you're not saying the old way can't exist as well, right? It's this is this another That's, way you could work if it works for you. That's right. Yeah, there's there's nothing saying that we're going to do a wholesale change. I don't believe in it. I think there's still companies that need strategic core resources uh, that are fixed, and you need to compensate them differently. And, and you can look at how how I may be able to save money by digitizing things and then creating a variable resource layer through talent marketplaces. And then that now frees up more money. So then I can uh, compensate my folks that I really want to be my strategic resources. And I want to try to really keep them around. You know, we're just saying consider inverting the firm, you know, as opposed to having all fixed resources, that's not very flexible and agile or elastic, consider, you know, what you're doing already, which is digitizing, automating some of this stuff. It's going to happen anyway. We're already talking about chat GPT and what the implications mm -hmm. there are. Then variable resources, and that opens up tons of opportunities by deconstructing jobs into projects and tasks. 
and then figure out what your core resources are and what how you want to compensate them differently. Say, hey, yeah, now I have money to give them three, four, five hundred thousand dollars to convince them to work sixty to eighty hour work weeks on this one thing, right? And not go out. And um, it, to me, it's like the free agency market in sports. Like, hey, I want you to be a Dallas Cowboy or a Cleveland Guardian or you know whatever sports team, right? You know that your 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 favorite sports team is. Uh, you guys are soccer fans, I bet over there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's the same kind of idea, but yeah, trying to get them to understand that there's no one perfect model, but technology is allowing us to create multiple pathways. And that's the real benefit. Absolutely. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you telling us all about Spacely and what you're up to. We wish you all the best with it. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah. Thank you both for having us here today. Thank you. Always gluten-free. It's Space and Things. So obviously this isn't going to work for everyone, but I really was fascinated by this. I guess probably because of the way I work as a musician, I don't put all my eggs into the basket of one venue. If I did that and that venue closed, all my work would be gone. I have to have different venues, different projects. I always use the analogy to people when I talk about what I do for a living is I have my fingers in many pies. That's how it has to be. And I always say any musician who puts all their eggs in one basket is a little bit foolish because that basket gets pulled out from under you and your livelihood is gone if that's how you're making your your bread and butter. So I think uh, this approach for a lot of people may really work within and give you an opportunity to get some work within the aerospace industry, which is pretty cool, right? Yeah, exactly. Like you said, you know, I, I'm a writer. You really benefit more from a gig economy than having like one thing. Because yeah. like you said, if you have one thing and it doesn't work out, then you got to look for another thing. You know, it's a very, it's really tough out there. Absolutely. I, I really like the concept of this spacely idea that it sort of, you know, allows you access to the aerospace industry, you know, and, and it's not like the old school way of looking for work. You know, right now, I'll, I'll be honest, right now I'm looking for full time work and it is just <laughs> it is just soul crushing. I mean, it, there I'll be real. It, there's a lot of nights <laughs> I try not to put it out my business out there but there are a lot of nights where i just am crying you know because it's tough you get rejected the logical part of me says you know it's not personal they probably you know whatever there's probably a better candidate who got this you know whatever it's nothing but you still take it a little personally like god this sucks why didn't i get it you know what especially if you did put your i i I tend to put a hundred percent into everything so There is that part of you that's like, what could I have done better? And usually there's nothing you could have done better. It's just they pick somebody else. So, um, you know, the conventional way of looking for jobs is really honestly excruciating. So I'm hoping Spacely and things that are like similar to Spacely, you know, really offer people access to the aerospace industry and they can build their resume or they can settle into a long term job and really succeed because I do feel like. The industry is very closed. A change needs to come is basically what I'm saying. So I'm really excited and I'm glad that Tom really sort of broke it down for us because I I knew a little bit about what Spacely does. He really clarified it for me. It's really sort of the future, I think. I'm hoping it's the future of finding work in this industry. Yeah, I really liked his answer when we talked about accessibility as well. The idea that traditionally, especially in the U.S., majority of aerospace jobs have existed in four geographical yep. areas, but it doesn't have to be that way. And how do you attract a more diverse group into the industry? And that's by saying you don't have to be living in those areas all the time or at all, perhaps. And I think that's a that was a really interesting point, which we often don't talk about when when we're discussing how to increase diversity. I'd never heard anyone say it in those terms before. And I, and I thought that was interesting because I was, I mean, I know this is now 30 years, 30 to 40 years ago, but I've been reading, or I just finished reading Truth, Lies and O-Rings by Alan McDonald, uh, who used to work at Thiokol yep. and was one of the managers there in the run-up to the Challenger disasters. Obviously, Thiokol built the solid ro- rocket motors. And... What's really interesting is obviously every person he names who worked at the company is a man. I think he may have 
t- spoken about just two women who were yeah. professionally involved somehow. One of whom was Dr. Sally Ride, who was an astronaut who was on the presidential commission looking into Challenger. The other thing he talks about a lot in the book is the old boys club. And yes, this was 30 years ago that used to ensure that the the buddies of the executive committees used to all get jobs. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why it's taken the aerospace industry so long to advance further than it did in those first few years back in the 50s and 60s. I'd like to think that some of that has changed, but I'm not so convinced that there has been widespread change throughout the aerospace industry. Yeah. I think NASA itself has obviously made a lot of changes over the last, you know, 50 or so years. I just read the book by Meredith Bagby, The New Guys, and it really touches on a lot of the same issues. And this is about 50 years ago. This isn't recent, but it touches on the fact that, you know, NASA was to a very large, very large extent dominated by white guys by 1972, 73 you know, it really had the worst record of equal opportunity other than the Atomic Energy Commission, which I know for a fact. Now, I think now it's the NRC, the Nuclear Regu- Regulatory. Wow, I run that word, Regulatory Commission. And I know for a fact that's just a sausage fest. It's just <laughs> mostly guys. That's just men. Yeah. You know, the nuclear industry is pretty much just dudes, white guys. That's all it is. So if NASA had a worse a diversity problem than that that's pretty bad yep. you know that's real bad but um 50 years ago you know a woman i think it was ruth bates harris i may be screwing her name up but there was a woman who was the head of the equal opportunity office at nasa and she did a report basically damning you know their their record on equal opportunity didn't she get fired yeah she got <laughs> fired for it basically yeah, they tried yeah. to cover that up by firing her and saying, oh, she didn't do a good job or some BS. I, I have stronger language, but this is a family show, so I don't want to use it. Then they rehired her when they realized their mistake or something like that. Yeah. Well, what happened was I think they, the, you know, people started to protest and then there was a congressional hearing and they eventually rehired her. But still, you know, that's pretty messed up. Like, oh, we're just going to fire the person who did this report that's showing us our inadequacies. Yeah. Granted, that was half a century ago, but still, that just shows us, you know, how bad things were in the industry back then was that, you know, there were really no, essentially no women in there, probably next to no African-Americans or Asian people in there at all. And I'm glad that, Tom touched on this, but I was talking to another friend recently. I don't want to put their name out here, but I was talking to him on a private message and I was and he was saying that, yeah, all the NASA centers were in the South yeah. back then. So there wasn't a good record of, you know, racial diversity or, or gender equality or anything like that because of the regions they were in. So Tom really sort of put that out there as well, that a lot of it is geographic. And nowadays, there is remote capability to work. You know, we have laptops. We have Zoom. There's a million different types of software where you can work and collaborate with people. And you don't have to necessarily step into an office. Mm. So things are ripe for a change. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, Spacely is doing something about it. And I think it will impact. I'm hoping it will impact diversity. Yeah. It's also great to see that NASA have got involved with this as well. Absolutely. I think that's really positive. Yeah. I, and I and I want to make it very clear. I, I was talking about the NASA 50 yeah, years ago. Of course. I, I think yeah. the NASA now, have, obviously, I think they're making huge strides and they've got the right attitude towards this. I didn't want to make it sound like NASA's the worst or something like that. Not at all. I think they've got the right approach idea now. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's all you can ask, isn't it? A lot of these historical institutions that that may have made mistakes in the past or or had problems in the past, all you can ask is that they're trying to to fix those problems, trying to move on, and and they have a plan to do it. And, And we've seen that with NASA, haven't we? We've seen that over the last 30 or 40 years, starting in the 70s starting with that very commission that you were talking about, even though that may have not been put into plan as well as it could have done, but they've from that moment, they've realized we need to address this and and they have done. So yeah, hopefully this episode has made people who might be considering a career change or want to get into the aerospace industry with whatever skill set they've got, 
might be able to know where they can now look to get started within that and see if there is something for them. There might not be. Spacely is fairly new and quite small at the moment. But if Spacely doesn't work for you, there might be other open market areas where you could have a look to see if they've got something for you. Absolutely. It opens up opportunities, I think. As always, the full unedited interview will be up on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash space and things. Where mispronunciation is entertainment. It's space and things. So, Emily, what's caught your eye in spaceflight this week? So, uh, Monday, we got an interesting piece of mail. Oh, yeah. We got a, a letter with it. So, I'm just going to read it, and, and then I'll uh, tease the, the other parts of the letter afterward. So, the letter starts, <laughs> Dear Ms. Carney, Enclosed, please find two books, Death by Black Hole for Dave Giles and Space Chronicles for you. Both are signed by Neil deGrasse Tyson. What? He sends you these books at the prompting of Dr. Larry Puzio. Please enjoy them. Sincerely, Madeline Frisch, executive assistant to Neil deGrasse Tyson. And the letterhead from this uh, letter is from the American Museum of Natural History Hayden Planetarium. What? So when I got this letter, I was like, I don't know anybody from the Hayden Planetarium other than, you know, I know Neil deGrasse Tyson is from there. And it is, it was from him. It was Larry. So so you have, I got to send it out today or tomorrow. You have a signed copy of Death by Black Hole. Amazing. It says inside for Dave Giles, welcome to the universe. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, wow. So I got to send it out to you. Um, I got to send it out either today or tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to, I need to get to the post office. And I got a copy of Space Chronicles. And let me look in mine. He signed it for Emily, fellow space cadet, Neil deGrasse Tyson, March 23. I'm like, oh my oh God. Oh my God. So, yeah. So this week in the mail, we received uh, signed books uh, by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Which was pretty awesome, and I want to thank. Um, we got to thank Dr. Larry Puzio for this. Um, this was really awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, so much, Larry. Very, wow. very humbled and very honored to uh, get these in the mail. This is a very awesome piece of. Uh, uh, I think we can add to our respective collections. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> uh, I mean, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Woo. <laughs> I wasn't expecting I know. that at all. Dr. Larry, you have totally redeemed yourself. Let me explain. He's redeemed himself because he's the person that won the May the 4th Space Hipsters trivia quiz this year, thus stealing my crown from the year before because <laughs> I was unable to attend this year. He's been holding on to Jar Jar Binks, the trophy, and I'm going to attempt to get it back off him for next year, but he's totally redeemed himself. He's back in my good books. But cheers, Dr. Larry. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, that is <laughs> this awesome. is amazing. So anyway, that was my news for this week. Um, <laughs> uh, so what about you, Dave? What have you been looking at? Well, you know what one of my passions is, right? Spacesuits. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So it's been a pretty big week for someone like me. The background of this story is that in 2022, NASA awarded the private company Axiom $228.5 million to build the agency's spacesuits, which will be worn on the moon. And this week, they've held a press conference and shown us the prototype of the suit, which will be worn by the Artemis three astronauts when they land on the moon. It's called the Axiom Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or AXEMU, which is a wonderful play on words. Anyway, it leveraged the XEMU, which was developed by NASA at Johnson Space Center over the last few years. The suit looks pretty cool in terms of what it can do, lots of flexibility and good protection against the environment on the moon, etc. One thing which was cool about the suit shown in the press conference was that it wasn't white, which... It actually will be when it goes on the moon. But for a bit of fun, they've made this prototype into the corporate colors of Axiom, which is a combination of blues and oranges. And this design was a collaboration with costume designer Esther Marquis, who designed the spacesuits used in our favorite TV show, For All Mankind. Oh, wow. 
So I did not know that. That's really freaking awesome. Oh my gosh. So that's pretty cool. And I will post some links to articles about these spacesuits. One thing which I find quite upsetting about this is that they will not return to Earth. Oh, wow. And I find that quite sad. That is sad. What they've said is that when the Artemis Three crew are due to leave the surface of the moon, they will pack the suits into the lander, which right now is scheduled to be a SpaceX starship. And then that starship will remain in lunar orbit while the astronauts transfer themselves and whatever samples they're bringing back with them into the Orion spacecraft that will bring them home. So unless someone goes and docks with that starship at a later date before its orbit decays and it crashes into the moon, we'll never see those suits again. Which for someone like me who has tried to see as many of the flown Apollo suits as possible, this is quite sad news. That is sad. What also is interested me is in an interview about these suits with Axiom President and CEO Michael Sufredini, whose name I may be pronouncing wrong, but that's what it looks like on the page to me. Uh, he talks about the fact that these won't come back. Uh, and he said, however, that is the current thought process, but this is several years from now, and those kind of things do come up. So it wouldn't surprise me if we had a conversation at some point as to what might be possible. Perhaps gloves or other small parts might come back. Right. Okay, great that some bits might come back there or the conversation may change. What I found interesting was he used the words several years because that would indicate that behind Ooh, closed doors, yeah. they know they're not on schedule for Artemis 3, which yeah. is supposed to be just a few years away, not several years. That's definitely a change in tone. Maybe he misspoke, but that doesn't seem to add up to me. Yeah, uh, he's probably, I hate saying he's this. He's probably right. He's probably right, yeah, because I'm like, I, I don't think a lunar lander has been like fully developed, you know? And we, Yeah, I mean, we've been talking about this very thing, the fact that this doesn't seem right. The timelines don't seem right. Yeah. and But this is the first time I've seen it publicly said by someone who's involved in that process. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Wow. You got to think, you know, the 60s, I mean... <laughs> We talked to Rusty Schweikert, if you guys didn't know, as one does. <laughs> we talked to Rusty Schweikert a few weeks ago, and it really struck me listening to the playback on the interview and thinking, you know, wow, you know, they, they had the lunar module and, you know, it, it took a few years for it to get developed, obviously. But once they got it, you know, up and up and going, it was really it was like three months from, you know, yeah. flying the first test flight of the lunar module to actually deploying it on the moon. You couldn't work that fast nowadays, but I don't think it's going to be like that for Artemis. You know, they're not, I don't think they're going to have like three months to fast track that, you know, or I wouldn't even say fast track it because I think in Apollo, that was just how it worked out. You know, things moved, things were moving a lot faster because I think, you know, they had this, they had the deadline that Kennedy set forth, right? So things were moving a lot faster back then. And you also have to think the lunar rover, I think, was, God, 18 months from, uh, I want to say... Commission to development, yeah. to deployment. Yeah, it was really quick turnaround. Yeah, and nowadays, that's just unheard of. I was just talking to an, another friend of mine this week, and we were like, where's the lunar lander <laughs> for this? And we were like, yeah. where is it? <laughs> but, but, but this is the interesting thing about this announcement of the suits. I found the timing of this really odd. I don't know why they've announced this now. I've got a theory, and it's fine. They're a private company, so I think this makes sense. What have they also announced this week? A few days later, they announced the Axiom 3 flight. Looks like it's going to be in November, and the crew selection part of that is going to be announced hopefully in the next week. So potentially this was a way of getting them in the news as a company and then being able to talk about the other things the company does, which they probably need more investment in. And these kind of news stories will get eyes on the company. Not only have they got this launch in November, but they're flying next month. It's all happening for them. So I think it makes sense for them to have this press conference. But what was interesting is this, this made the news over here. And I've had so many people 
reach out to me going, I didn't know we were going to be mo- walking on the moon next year. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're not. We're not. We're not move- yeah, we're not doing that. The announcement said that they're going to the moon next year on, on Artemis 2. Yeah, they are. Maybe next year, probably... Their, their plan is for late next year, but that's not walking on the moon. That's going around yeah. the moon. These suits aren't actually part of that mission. Yeah. Oh, that wasn't clear. And that's the issue. Like everything's getting a bit blurry and I can see, I know this is the second week in a row we're talking about this. I can see this messaging. If it's not clear, if the lack of integration in the messaging, the, the fact that you've got private companies involved and they're doing their own press releases that may not, they may not align with the actual schedule required that that that's set out by everyone else. I yeah. don't know. It, it just seems like potentially there's mixed messages coming out, and I'm not sure that's helpful. And again, it's the second time in a row I've criti- second week in a row I'm criticising this program just because of this press issue and the scheduling and all that kind of stuff. Might be completely out of line here, but it does seem odd to me. Yeah, it seems like there's a lack of. Um, cohesion yeah cohesion and uh, you know there needs to be better communication I, I'm sure what happens because you know I've worked in aerospace and you know sometimes you have to go through vendors to really get their you know okay we approve of what you're saying on like a either a press release or like a piece you wrote that might have a, a piece yeah. about their company right and that's understandable yeah. that's completely understandable you want to make sure that you're towing the line and doing right by them Obviously, yeah, I completely understand it, but it, it is very vague messaging, and I'm I'm wondering how, what the process is like between like uh, Axiom and and NASA. Like, I'm sure NASA has to clear their press releases, but you know, if I was the NASA person, I might be like, mm, do I want to? Why did he say several? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> why did he say several? That's not on message. Yeah, I, I wonder about that just because you know I'm somebody who has had experience in you know, writing certain things and you want to put it, you want to make sure, you know, you both are on the same page when you put it out, you know, exactly. So yeah, that is kind of unusual. And I feel like there's a lack of sort of like, as you said, cohesion. Yeah. Yeah. There needs to be a clearer messaging calendar amongst all the parties involved. Absolutely. Anyway, that's what's caught my eye this week. Spacesuits. They're very cool. But are we ever going to see them? Who knows? Yes. Are we going (laughs) to see them again? More Skylab fact? Yes, please. It's space and things. A big thank you to our Patreon subscriber, Todd Oliver, for his help with our stings this week. Don't forget, if you're one of our Patreon subscribers, please just send me a voice memo with some things that you think might be funny or fun to have in between our little sections. Uh, you can sign up on patreon.com forward slash space and things if you haven't already. And a big thanks to anyone who's done that and anyone who shares the podcast with your friends. As always, we'll be back next week, but don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. Things in space, space and things. Okay. <laughs>